Welcome to Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson. I'm your host, Scott Dodgson. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, a portrait of an American mariner. Now, oftentimes we think about this and we think about naval heroes or we think about, um, you know, racing captains and uh, other people that have sailed like to the North Pole or the South Pole or raced around the world or did a variety of different things uh, sailing on the boat. But there's a different kind of portrait that I want to do about the American Mariner because they, they exist not in a vacuum. They exist because the American Mariner exists because of commerce or war um, or the other purpose would be uh, exploration. So the central character in this movie about America would be the sailors themselves and the captains and the supporting characters would be the entrepreneurs and the visionaries that facilitated their direction and their motive. I mean, you have to, you know, kick back and, and understand that these ships, uh, whether they were, uh, you know, just wood, um, barks or sloops or whatever they were, they, uh, they were a big investment for someone. And just as we all know, when going to buy our own boats, it's, it costs money and it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing. So when you start to get into trading worldwide and going across oceans with a crew of 250 to 300 sailors, uh, the responsibility is, is enormous. But the person the visionary, the businessman that's taking that risk, that's putting his money out on the water, is somewhat of the subject of today. So the leading character and supporter of this, and this is a very American story, I should say, because most of the European and Asian ports had often uh, already been developed and had been in use for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. But in the United States, ports were new. People were building ports. They were picking the places out and saying, yeah, this is where we're going to have a port. So somebody who had the vision to see a spot, and let me explain, it was not an easy spot to see the Los Angeles uh, Harbor. And I'm talking about who was a man who was both a mariner and a visionary businessman named Phineas Banning, and he's known as the father of the port of Los Angeles. He built the first breakwater in San Pedro to uh, protect ships uh, from the sea. Uh, earlier, um, Fremont, Captain Fremont of the United States Navy came into the port and decided that the port wasn't, it wasn't a good place for a port. Um, although he signed, um, he signed the paperwork that that gave California to uh, from that gave California to the United States from Mexico, and he you know decided that Los Angeles it wasn't worth it. This this port was this area of of water south of um, the Palos Verdes Peninsula and um, south from there it just wasn't a good place. Um, that was later to be proved uh, wrong. And Phineas Banning was the one who developed the first uh, uh, breakwater that was uh, put to protect the ships so they could unload. And he developed the whole thing. Now, you have to understand that area, it's a part of Los Angeles today, but Los Angeles was a tiny little dusty citrus farm type town, um, even before movies. That was about 21 miles, still is, uh, from uh, where the port is today. And the port actually lies um, part in San Pedro and part in Wilmington. And Wilmington was named after Phineas Banning's hometown in Wilmington, Delaware. I can relate to Phineas um, because he, he was born in Wilmington, and his brother uh, moved to Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia was where I was born. 
And he had, like walked from Wilmington to Philadelphia when he was like 13. Um, he worked for his brother who was uh, an assistant to a law firm. And um, he grew up there, basically his informative years. And he learned a lot. And at the age of 20, he signed up to work on a passage of, uh, of a steamship um, to the exotic destination of Southern California. Now, it's important to put the framework of Philadelphia in, in, at this point in time, because we're talking about 1840s. And he was a very big man, a very bright man, very energetic, and and he it would have been a very uh, Philadelphia would have been a very influential time for them, um, because at that time uh, there was a tremendous uh, influx of Irish and German immigrants. Uh, you know, regular service uh, from the steamship uh, operators brought a lot of people a lot of money. And um, there's a small tidbit, uh, according to, quote-unquote, Edward Smith of the Immigration Office in Londonderry. His inquiry came across with a detailed account of the migration to Philadelphia from just Londonderry. 2,500 Irish and Germans had left that year by the summer, and another seven voyages were planned before the winter shutdown. The McCorbell ship line had received 24,000 pounds sterling in tickets alone in 1850. This is an astonishing number. I mean, I don't know what that would be inflation-wise, but it it has to be uh, 50, 60 million dollars, somewhere in that neighborhood. So Phineas was a, was working down on the wharves of Philadelphia, and I go back to, to that point because... When I was a kid, um, I grew up in Philadelphia, and I used to go and hang out down at the docks. Sometimes we'd ride our bicycles um, up to the Fairless uh, Hills Steelworks, which was uh, U.S. Steelworks, and see the big ships offloading their iron ore and stuff for the steel mill up there. This was like really like one of the best things you could do, and, and we would fish uh, for eels. There was all these eels up there. And, um, you know, we would catch them and, you know, kid with each other that they were electric and, you know, just crazy, you know, 12 year old kid today, you wouldn't let your 12 year old kid go that far. But back in the day, we just roamed free. Um, and one of the places that we ended up going down to, um, which was easy for us to get to was, uh, all the docks that were lined up, um, along center city in Philadelphia and then down to, uh, the shipyard, which was the Naval Yard. And this is where they kept the mothball fleet. And if you don't know, the mothball fleet was all the ships in the U S Navy that they weren't using anymore. Um, but they were still pretty good and they, you know, they were going to keep them. Um, so they had them all preserved, so to speak. Um, and, and just, it was astounding to see so many, you know, gray, big gray ships from cargo ships to battleships. Um, I went on board the USS Wisconsin when it was there. Um, the USS New Jersey, um, great fun, just great fun to see these, these ships, and in Los Angeles today, we have the, the USS Iowa, which, to be honest, looks so small. Um, and and it's, it's kind of, you know, it's big, big uh, in comparison to a sailboat or something. But, you know, given the mega yachts are a little bit bigger than these ships, uh, it's pretty amazing. And they've sort of lost, um, they were the last hurrah of the naval ship uh, being a gun platform. Um, You know, all throughout the age of sail, the Navy, uh, whether the American Navy, and especially the British Navy, the French Navy, um, their ships were were ships for battle um, with cannon on them. And the ships were were basically platforms to, to put their their cannons into the enemy's uh, ports and and to fight its ships uh, side by side. 
and and that's just that that's the way that war was fought at that point and an extension of that was the battleship was also um that giant cannon um but it was not so much for ship to ship uh battles but it was to move artillery pieces uh offshore and to bombard um uh, land sites and the enemy um from a distance and of course the 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 big thing was when the jersey new jersey went to uh, beirut lebanon which i remember very well and um they started to fire the new jersey and and the cannon the the shells were like you know like the size of a small vw and no one who was you know except for some of the old timers um had ever seen uh, a shell that big launched from a ship 15 miles away offshore and hit targets like like and just destroy everything um it was uh, it was just everybody was just astonished um at the power of these ships but i digress and get back to phineas so phineas was this big guy he was probably six two six three um he was very bright. He was Irish, um, and you have to sort of kick back if if you're of Irish heritage. Um, you know, you were thought of very lowly um, because of all the Irish that were coming in that were poor. Um, they had escaped the pota- potato famine in Ireland. Um, the Germans had their own famines, and they had war. So they settled in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia still has traces of this great German heritage. Uh, the Germans uh, pretty much were uh, craftsmen, and they kind of took over the craftsmen um, business, so to speak, at the time. Uh, the Irish, they did the same, um, not so much in the business, but they were sort of your dock workers, your regular people, and you know, dig ditches, build stuff, uh, craftsmen and stuff like that. I mean, the extension of that would be Kelly for brickwork and um, John Kelly, who very Irish, um, and his uh, his daughter, um, the Queen of Monaco, Princess Grace Kelly. Um, this is all an extension of this period of 40, 50, 60 years that um, saw the Irish uh, settle and the Germans settle in Philadelphia and develop a, a life. But Phineas had other ideas. And part of this was that he was aware of all the influx. He was on the docks working um, on the Delaware River, and uh, which is a great river, by the way. And um, it's the like I think one of the largest rivers that doesn't have a um, a dam on it. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful river. And um, very bucolic once you get it up past Trenton and Washington's Crossing and, you know, all the way up to Frenchtown. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous river. But with Phineas, he had gained a lot of experience um, and had confidence in talking to a lot of people. But in this period, there was something more that was going on. And it was a, a fever that was infecting everybody. And it was gold rush fever. Gold had been found in California. And everybody was affected by it. People were trying to race across the country. Now, there was only two ways to get to California. Um, the one way was to get on a ship, which is what Phineas did, and go to Panama, cross Panama Isthmus, get on another ship, and then go up to California. This was an expensive way to go, but a relatively face, uh, a relatively safe way to go. The other way to go would be to hop in a wagon and your horse and go across the continental the United States, which we have tons and tons of stories for this. And, you know, even if you look at the, you know, they called them the prairie schooners. 
the idea of the schooner and the ship and and it was you know he made it all the way across america the prairie schooner and and phineas decided that he was he was going to be a mate um and he was on a ship that was a steamship okay so it was a combination of steam and sail now, which is really interesting is, is that this time in the mariner world, um, sailors were really um, losing out on jobs. To run a steamer, you needed 12 firemen shoveling coal 12 hours a day, along with a crew of 6 to 12 to operate the ship. It took 11 days to go from Philadelphia to the east side of the Isthmus of Panama. Now, sailors, we all know this is this. There wasn't the uh, intercoastal waterway, so they had to do it outside, and they had to do it against the Gulf Stream. So this was a real slog and an uncomfortable slog. And I I say this because I've actually sailed that part, not from Philadelphia, but actually from New York and south. And, you know, you have two choices. Get on the outside of the Gulf Stream, which means practically four or 500 miles off the coast, sail down and then cross in, or stay close, relatively close, which is a lot of danger. Get past, you know, Cape Hatteras and the graveyard of ships out there. And, and essentially you're motoring um, for the most part. Um, you, you do get some good winds, but the current is a very, very you know, present and it's a, it's a strong current. Some of the eddies, you know, can get up to five or six knots. And if you have a seven knot boat, that gives you two knots of uh, a speed over ground. So this was a, this was a, you know, this was a difficult thing. And at the time, industry wise, there was, it took like 300 men to sail a normal ship. And so they reduced it down to, you know, less than 100 people to run these large uh, steamships. And it required a completely different set of skills. Of course, they had to have sailors to, because they had sails and they had to occasionally put those up. But people had to be able to steal. They had to repair uh, boilers. They had to shovel coal. Um, they had general maintenance of machinery, which you wouldn't have on a sailboat. So Panama steamers were uh, wooden hull, uh, with wooden hulls with uh, side wheelers, side wheels, uh, and they were driven by a massive single-stroke steam engine. It had low boiler pressures, requiring the engines with bores and strokes measured in feet to yield a few hundred horsepower. Because these engines were so enormous and turned so slowly that the paddle wheels had to have a huge diameter, and they were up to 30 feet. A big paddle wheel box gave these ships like the look of a massive power. But in fact, I mean, we have Vespas that run faster and put out more horsepower. Any case, the enormous engines that were turning very slow and the high speeds required for the large diameter created a lot of uh, problems and breakdowns and this stuff was all wood so they were always constantly repairing this kind of stuff but Phineas um, signed on actually as a clerk and he managed to uh, get going and get on a ship and it took him to the Isthmus of Panama. So I want you to imagine you're 20 years old and, you know, you've got good health, you're a big guy, whatever, and you arrive in Sharjah, Panama. And Panama at the time was controlled by Nicaragua. Um, So the young Phineas, he would have uh, disembarked with about 200 or so passengers. And then there's this 60-kilometer walk across the Isthmus that would have been just so filled with wonder and amazement. I mean, if you can remember the first time, if you're from the northern climates, 
if you go to a tropical climate and you get off the plane or the boat or whatever the case may be and you feel that warmth and humidity and just how wonderful that feeling is, you know that Phineas was going through the same things. 11 days out of, of, uh, out of Philadelphia wasn't a lot of time. So, you know, the adjustment, once he got down to southern Florida, they had to go around Florida, then cross past uh, Belize, you know, and, and all the weather that they had to uh, consider and hurricanes and all the rest of this kind of stuff without modern uh, radar or weather predictions or whatever the case you went, you know, whatever kind of technical detail you could get to make a safer voyage, they just didn't have. So they just went. They shoveled coal and they just churned it up. They took 200 people. Uh, they got them to a place that was really quite picturesque, but also incredibly dangerous. So most of the culture there was Hispanic and Indian cultures. And this would have left a deep impression on him. And it's important to do this because, you know, uh, there was slavery um, throughout the United States. Um, he, would been, he would have been very aware of slavery and being Irish, he would have been very aware of the fact that, you know, he was just a half a step above being a slave. And this would have made him, and in past writings and comments about him, he was a very open person um, and respected everyone. And this is really to his, his credit. Um, because he was able to work with people. But just to give you an idea of what he was dealing with on this 60-kilometer walk through a very, very formidable jungle. Now, I don't know how many of my listeners have been to Panama or done the, done the canal. Um, I've done the canal uh, once, um, I had Tommy Twang on, uh, who recites doing the canal. It's a big industry. Um, there's a lot of shit going on, and it's a really interesting place. I did have the opportunity to get out and into the countryside and see how Panama has developed. Um, but this case, these people were out there, and just just imagine this thing. There's like 900 species of birds to be found on the isthmus. I mean, there are big cats, there's jaguars and pumas and ocelots and, and, and there's monkeys and anteaters and sloths and all sorts of fascinating animals that a young man from Delaware would have never even knew existed. And the whole time he's got to fight his way through because they're building a railroad, okay? Getting across the isthmus because there's a lot of lakes, it's essentially tropical, it's, it's swamp, for the most part. It still is swamp, okay? And they had to build a railroad. And in 1850, the, the railroad was just starting, and this is when Phineas arrived. So it would be the Chagres to Cologne. And the work had started, and there were, they probably had gotten maybe, by our estimation, about 10 kilometers of the surveyed route. And it was all tropical swamp. So it was very slow, the work, costly and dangerous. They had to build docks. They had to put in pilings. They had to backfill all that with rocks. And Phineas, getting off the boat, he wasn't going to stop there. But he would have seen the effort that it was taking to get this built. Okay? And he would have just walked down and, and looked at it, understood it put it back in his file cabinet in his head, and kept on going. So he followed the old Spanish conquistador path, which had been reopened for some time. And actually about 10,000 passengers had rushed across the isthmus uh, before Phineas even got there. Everybody was eager to make a claim in California. There was over 40,000 49ers. Those are the people looking for gold in California, as they're called. Um, as they were labeled, and, and they would follow, and they would follow him. And once the railroad was built, just to give you an idea, 
It was an 11 day journey by canoe and foot and it was reduced to four hours. So it took, it took 11 days to get to 60 kilometers. I mean, you could, you could walk 60 kilometers in, 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 in what, two days maybe? I mean, at a leisurely pace. So you could just get the idea how tough going, walking and sailing, you know, canoeing through these swamps were. So he would have arrived, and he did arrive in Panama City, and he would have found the town filled with travelers waiting for the next ship. Um, I found an American journalist named Bayard Tal- Taylor, and he described the, uh, the Panamanians in positive terms. And it's important to note that this is how people saw other people, uh, people of color. They were a cleanly people, bathing daily and changing their dresses as often as they were spoiled, he wrote. The children have their heads shaved from the crown to the neck, and as they go about naked with abdomens unnaturally distended from exclusive vegetable diet, are off figures enough, means putting off, they put him off. They have bright black eyes, are quick and intelligent in their speech and motions. This sort of analytical, this was a nice thing. Some of the other stuff that I've, I read was like, was, I mean, the vehemence and the, uh, the hate. And, and, but this has just got this sense of arrogance, like, oh, look at this pet monkey we have. You know, that's the kind of thing it was. And Phineas was very aware of this and very sensitive to this. And it's important in later in, later in his life um, that he, he was very much an equal opportunity uh, businessman. And he respected everybody. And this is, this is part of the, the, the fabric and attitudes that created California for what California is today. So there were no schedules um, between the East and the West. So people would come across this after this 11-day journey um, and then another 11 days, so it's a month. Um, and then they had to wait to get on a ship. And there was a, always a scuffle from what I read. And tickets were um, $125 for the voyage. And they jumped up to about four or 500 uh, dollars, because there was a steady flow of ships, but it could take, they could be, you know, you'd have to wait for a month or two months, maybe even three months. That would go up the coast. Now, when you think about it, Phineas already did this journey um, into the current, um, tough sail, and now he's going to turn around in Panama and go back up the Pacific current. So it's all uphill. And this is one of the reasons this current and the wind is one of the reasons that Los Angeles wasn't given much due in the early um, in the early centuries. It, it really was Los Angeles developed because of the steam engine. Now this is this is a comparison. The interesting thing about Phineas, the voyage down from Philadelphia to the Isthmus would have cost anywhere about two hundred fifty bucks. Now, 250 bucks is a lot of money at the time. Don't get me wrong. This is, this is like your $15,000, $25,000 excursion, okay? And now the ticket prices are four or $500, twice as much. But Phineas is a clever dude because he's got his sailing papers. He's a sailor. So he signed on to the first ship that came in as a clerk. Ships were having a huge problem because the crews were jumping ship when they got to San Francisco to go dig for gold. So these return trips were people who either had found gold, and many people would watch these um, miners who had struck rich come back with these huge uh, cases and boxes of gold. And that just fueled the, f- the fever now, here's the interesting thing is, is that because these guys are jumping off, the ship would come back and they would be really looking for, for people. 
um, to help man the ship. And Phineas had his papers, and so he he basically got a free trip both ways. Um, worked a trip, of course, and it was it was just you know very indicative of the kind of guy he was. Um, he could travel all the way across the country and essentially be paid to travel across the country and get fed. Being fed is a big deal. Uh, so the the ship was bound, um, actually, it was going to stop in San Pedro. And, and Phineas was uh, pretty quick to uh, suss out what was going on in Los Angeles. And what's interesting thing here is, is I always... The question always haunted me. Why did Phineas Banning decide to get off the boat in Los Angeles? You have to understand, Los Angeles was a nothing place. Nothing place. San Francisco was booming. Okay? Everybody was going to San Francisco. Digging gold. Success. People were having success selling stuff to miners. There was a lot of success going on out there. And it always haunted me why Phineas Banning would just say, okay, no, I'm going to go here. Well, there is a reason, and this is related to what's going on here in Los Angeles now with all the ships sitting outside of the harbor, anchored, waiting for their turn to offload their containers, is the ship services that are running back and forth. Phineas saw an opportunity, and this opportunity had been mentally been prepared for him throughout his entire trip from the time in his experience in Philadelphia to his experience in seeing the railroad being built um, of the of the thousands of people crossing the isthmus of the clamoring to get on ships the fever of people wanting to go he was he was a savant in terms of the transportation system that was appearing in front of him. And he really would have known a lot of this from his experience in Philadelphia, which was far more sophisticated and much more um, together technologically than uh, a lot of other ports in the world, and and even including um, the Port of New York. They were, they were very much, Philadelphia was very much a dominant uh, port compared to New York. And one of the reasons that New York became the favorite is because of the shorter distance to sail from England and the, and the continent, France in particular and Belgium, to sail from there um, to New York was faster. They can offload and get more people, more trips in. Then it was to sail down and then come back up, uh, sail down, go around Cape May, and then up the Delaware River um, and disembark there. Um, But the facilities for which people were coming, the desire for for land and farming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Philadelphia was really the place to be. Um, It had a, a much more sophisticated economic environment farming uh, environment and was just a uh, all around more interesting place uh, for your people that were just leaving their country just on the hope that they would have an opportunity to find work or something that they could eat um, basic stuff here basic stuff so Phineas being the interesting human being he was, he saw that they needed a a ship to shore services. So he started one. He got off the ship in in Los Angeles, San Pedro, and he started this ship to, to services, ship to shore services, which meant essentially either sailing or rowing a boat. At the time, they started to have uh, little boats, which they built, um, Phineas uh, started uh, a store, um, which is logical, um, because he had to keep all the stuff in. So as the ships came in, um, they would need to replenish their supplies. Uh, He collected the supplies. uh, They would pay for it. He'd make some money on it. And he would roll them out to these ships and um, offload them and, and help bring their goods that were coming to 
to uh, uh, Los Angeles in and and back and forth. So he had this little he had this little business and he had this little store. And of course, the store was visited by the people that were in the area of San Pedro. It began to develop to uh, even greater extent with the stagecoach. I mean, many people look at the um, Wells Fargo uh, logo and the stagecoaches that we're all we've all seen in the movies. Phineas Banning started to build those because he had to run from San Pedro the 21 miles up to Los Angeles, and he was moving passengers back and forth. So he was really into this whole transportation thing. And this is the, you know, this is the sailor on horseback giving due to Jack London stories. So this is this is where he was. So he started building the the um, stagecoaches, and he was he was running stagecoaches from San Pedro to Los Angeles, to Yuma, Arizona, to Salt Lake City, and back. So he set up this this circular pattern with all the stagecoaches. He he set up the mule team. You know, if you remember, was it 20 mule team borax or the mule team borax? You know, he set up these 20 mule uh, wagons, built these the really stout wagons that they would load stuff up to take to the interior off the ships. And this was this was a big thing. And he did the same thing. This became a monstrous business. And it became part of the lore. When you think of stagecoaches as part of the Western American lore, do you think of the the mule skinner and the mule trains? This this is Phineas Banning. This is where all this came from. And he was actually one of the mule drivers. He he did all this stuff. He just didn't just finance it and sit back. No, he did this. He had developed all of this before he was like 32 or 33 years old. Then he built a railroad because there's so much traffic, and he knew the importance of this railroad. And he invested, he got a bunch of other people to invest with him, and they built 21 miles of the railroad to go from San Pedro, the harbor, up to Los Angeles. And that 21 miles was the first railroad in this part of Southern California, period. And while he was doing this, he began building the breakwater and to protect the ships so he didn't have to he could have docks and the ships could come to the docks and it would be easier to offload. And so he built this this he started to build a it was close to seven thousand foot breakwater. And um, you know, that just took wagons, it took men, it took rock, it took sand. Um, and he supervised building all of this. And the ships came in. He became richer. He became richer and richer. And then the Transcontinental Railroad, the Pacific Railroad, was coming, and they had to make a decision whether the, the Pacific Railroad was going to go to Los Angeles and be its terminus, or it was going to go to San Diego and be its terminus. Now, Phineas knew that, that if the railroad was not coming to Los Angeles and the port of Los Angeles, there would be, it would not, there would be nothing. That whole, his whole enterprise would just wither away. And San Francisco, or not San Francisco, but San Diego would become the big place, right? So what he did is he managed, he traded his 21 miles of railroad, which the Pacific... Uh, railroad wanted as a part of a, a spur um, for the Transcontinental Railroad. They wanted that. And he traded that, and he became the Pacific Railroad's agent of record in Los Angeles. Now, if you don't know what that means, it means that every little train that came in and every good, everything, um, Phineas Banning got a piece of that action. And he built... The town of Wilmington, and the town of Wilmington is very much changed. It's a very different kind of town. His home is still there. Um, the Banning family is um, still about, um, and he created this uh, amazing 
um, this amazing port. I mean, the combination of Long Beach and uh, the Port of Los Angeles, which literally, folks, if you've never been here and don't understand it, they're right next to each other. It's just that they're, it's actually just one giant port to a certain extent. Um, different uh, um, uh, management, but still the same. Basically, they're all stuck together. And Phineas created all this. And he did this after such a great experience of crossing. And he's a very well-known sailor um, and builder. And I just think that the American Mariner in general is, is a very industrious character. And he's, he kind of has all the right things that really make an American. And I think we've lost a little bit of that today. I'm editorializing here. But I think we've lost some of that, that gun-ho spirit, um, that don't complain and get it done kind of spirit. Um, there's a lot of people that, that don't know the truth about themselves, but the American Mariner knows the truth about himself. And Phineas Banning certainly know, knew who he was. And he created something that, is going to last a thousand years, the Port of Los Angeles. I want to thank you all for listening. Um, just uh, a couple of notes. Um, I have been, because of uh, doing some book stuff, and I actually had jury duty last week, um, which sort of kept me away from the uh, writing in the podcast. But uh, I will endeavor to, uh, to keep you more informed. Um, please visit our site, offshoreexplorer.org. Um, you can message me there and send me an email if you have any requests, any topics you'd like to discuss or you'd like me to um, talk about. Uh, I'd be happy to take your, uh, your uh, uh, suggestions. Um, that does it for us today. Um, Music uh, by the beautiful Paulette McWilliams was first. And uh, this Afterglow is the title of this by uh, my dear friend Tommy Twang. Um, thank you very much. I hope you have some smooth seas and uh, uh, gentle winds and you get to go where you're going. Uh, we'll have some more American Mariner character stories. Uh, later on, um, it's good to know where you came from. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Good day.